You know what's not smart? Texting while driving. I'm happy to finally make this podcast into what I've always dreamed it would be, which is a public service announcement. It is not smart to text while you drive. Don't do it. You know what is smart? Hiring a ZipRecruiter. ZipRecruiter's powerful technology. It finds people with the right experience for your job, and it actively invites them to apply. So you get qualified candidates fast because you're going after the candidates themselves. You're not waiting for them to come to you. That's why ZipRecruiter is rated number one by employers in the U.S. based on a trust pilot rating of hiring sites with over 1,000 reviewers. Now, right now, listeners of this show can try ZipRecruiter for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash EZRA. That is ZipRecruiter.com slash EZRA. ZipRecruiter, it is by far the smartest way to hire. Why do you think you lost the primary? I lost because I wasn't Trump enough in the age of Trump. Hello, welcome to Ezra Klein Show on the Vox Media Podcast Network. We are so close to an election. And so I've been thinking about who who is interesting to hear from right now. Who has a perspective on this? that most people don't have. And one of the people who kept coming to mind was Congressman Mark Sanford. You probably know Mark Sanford's name. He was elected to Congress first in 1994. He's one of the Gingrich revolutionaries, and he was one of the most conservative Gingrich revolutionaries, a sort of libertarian conservative. He became governor of South Carolina in 2002. And then he became famous, and he said no to the stimulus funding, and he was talked about as a Republican candidate for president. And then he hiked the Appalachian Trail, and it seemed like his career was over. Um, Hiking the Appalachian Trail, of course, turned out to be being in Argentina to be with someone he was having a romantic affair with. And that seemed like the end of Mark Sanford in politics. And then it wasn't. He came back. There was an open House seat in South Carolina. He won that House seat. He came back after all of that. And he came back in in this very different pose. He was much more open. When you cover politicians, there are so many layers between them and the public and the press and the questions are answered between, between everyone and sort of what is underneath. And with Sanford, he went through all this and a lot of reporters remarked on this. A lot of those layers seem to get stripped away. The, he was more himself even than he'd been before. Then Donald Trump rose and Sanford, very conservative guy, but he was not a Trump fan. And he was pretty clear about that. He talked about the president in this case, not just candidate Trump as fanning flames of intolerance, of, of doing damage to the truth. And so Sanford has became this very interesting um, and pretty unusual member of Congress who was showing there is this difference between ideology and partisanship. He was remaining extremely conservative, but he was not getting on board with the Trump train. And so that led to a primary challenge and it led to Donald Trump endorsing his primary challenger and Sanford lost in the primary. So now he's going to be out again after the new Congress comes into play in January. And so he just has this very unusual vantage point on so much in our politics right now, on ideology, on partisanship, on Trump, on the way the Republican Party has evolved, on what the Republican Party actually stands for. What is the Republican Party? What unites it? Because it clearly isn't what Congressman Sanford thought it was. So uh, a few weeks ago, I asked uh, Congressman Sanford if he would sit down with me to talk about all this on the podcast, and, and he did. And I'm grateful, very grateful for him taking the time for this conversation. As always, you can email me at EzraKleinShow at Vox.com with your guest ideas, suggestions, whatever. I always appreciate hearing from you. Again, that is EzraKleinShow at Vox.com. Here is Congressman Mark Sanford. Congressman Sanford, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. How does it feel to be leaving here for the second time? It's a little surreal. You know, I was packing boxes actually this morning. Oh, yeah? And um, it's bittersweet. Um, I've dedicated a big part of my life to this process, the institution. And uh, and you don't know what comes next. Could be great. Uh, and so on my good days, I'm like, this is exciting. It's a new chapter of life. On my bad days, it's like, boy, I've invested a lot of time and energy in the democratic process in terms of trying to represent uh, conservative ideals, South Carolina, go down the list, and uh, what comes next? I don't know, but I, my prayer is God open doors and close doors, and we'll see what comes. Why do you think you're leaving here? What? Why do you think you lost the primary? I lost because I wasn't Trump enough in the age of Trump. Did you expect that? Did you know it was going to go that way? Didn't know it. I, I knew I was playing with fire. Um, it's interesting. My media guys had said, look, 
cool it, um, you know, uh, outside of Flake and Corker over on the Senate side, uh, and, and let's say Ben Sass, at least on the House side, you're as out there as anybody gets in terms of being critical of some of what the president has done. But, you know, it was interesting, Mount Pleasant magazine, little magazine back home, wrote an article uh, just this week, and their observation was uh, Mark's strength was his weakness. My strength has always been uh, I've been outspoken at times to a fault on things that I believed in. Um, and that has carried me far in basically 25 years of politics um, through amazing ups and downs. You know, when I was given a second chance in politics, basically people said, look, we don't in any way approve of how you handled this particular chapter over here. But we know you and we trust you and we'll give you a second chance. That's that's an amazingly humbling journey to go through. And so part of what led me to where I was when my guys would say, look, watch out, you're playing with fire. I said, I know I am. I'm not unaware. But I have been given a second chance in politics. And it becomes that much more important that you say what you believe, you say what you believe to be the truth. Because if not, why be here? Particularly when one is given a second chance. So... Did I think it would go exactly as it did? I knew it was going to be close. I knew I was playing with fire. Would have rather it gone the other way. But it was a magnificent evening. I would ask you to pull the tape. I gave a rather elongated talk. I talked for about 15 minutes or so in my concession speech. Um, I have questions that are longer uh, than that. Yeah, yeah, exactly <laughs> right. And uh, um but if the TV cameras are running, they don't generally don't want you talking for 15 sure. minutes. And, uh, and yet I had my four sons with me that night. And to a boy, they all said, look, Dad, if you got to go, this is the way to go. You've told us you need to stand up for certain things you believe in. You did. And you knew there might be consequences. That's the way we want you to go. Welcome home. Were you wrong about what the Republican Party either was or had become? Absolutely not. Not only was I playing with fire and broaching the subject and risking the president's ire and him tweeting in my, my camp. I mean, how unusual is that the president of the United States tweeting in a, in a congressional race uh, when you're of the same party? And then he, you know, came to the House caucus and spoke out against me. And then he had rallies and whatnot. But I was saying the truth, which is not only was I playing with fire by bringing it up, but we are playing with fire as a society in what we're tolerating and accepting in the political arena these days. And if we don't watch out, we're going to get burned in that fire. And what, what were you saying? We've, we've talked about, you've sort of used a euphemism playing with fire, but what were you saying that was so combustible? I was saying a couple of different things. One, though I happen to support the overwhelming bulk of the president's agenda uh, from a policy standpoint. Yeah, you I'm, you I'm voted with him right. roughly 90 percent right, of the right. time. Right, I'm right. I'm a conservative Republican. But I spoke out on a couple things wherein I did disagree. One was on the notion of truth. In an open political system, truth matters. And this idea of alternative facts and alternative truth is what you hear in places like Russia – it's not what you hear uh, or have historically heard in the United States, which is you might be um, uh, well left of me on the political scale. I might be to the right of you. But if we say here's a problem and, and there is truth about this problem, now we can have a debate and we can maybe forge some kind of conclusion between our different starting points that come as a result of the philosophy that we might hold. If there is no truth, if it's all subjective, you cannot come to any kind of conclusion on anything, and it creates utter chaos in our political system. So one was the danger of not telling the truth in an open political system. Two was the degree to which he commanded personal allegiance. We have a system based on being a nation of laws and not men. Our founding fathers were so deliberate about saying, wait a minute, none of y'all are angels. Let's have a system that we believe in, institutions that we believe in, not a system of allegiance to one man or one woman. And yet, if you cut it to the chase, his big beef with me was I wouldn't salute allegiance to him. 
and and that caused some friction. So did I call for his tax returns? Yes. Why? Because he said he would release them, and uh, he said it on multiple occasions, and and yet it was a sort of a slow step, slow step, and then no, I'm not going to do it. And my point at that time was, what am I supposed to do? I mean, a report comes to me because I happen to be a former governor in the House of Representatives. I think at that time the only one. And they say, hey, do you think whoever the nominee is ought to release their tax returns, knowing full well I'd release mine twice uh, when I got the nomination for governor? And you'd say yes. And then turns out the president gets the, uh, the, the nomination. And they come back to you at that time and they say, you know, do you think that Trump ought to release his tax returns? You can't reverse your opinion unless you're living in the world that we live in today where everybody's reversing their opinion on all kinds of things and and say, well, no, I don't think because of Tim he should. You say what you said before, which is he ought to. Apparently, he took things like that quite personally, which goes to the allegiance question. And the last thing that I have real problems with is, you know, the Republican Party has historically stood for certain ideals on not just less taxes but less spending, on limited government, on engagement with the rest of the world in terms of trade. And we have been sidestepping those historic mooring points for what the party was about in the age of Trump. And I think that that's a real problem going forward, both in a political sense and in a policy sense. I want to pick up on two things you said there about truth and about what the Republican Party has stood for. So one of the things that I try to think about a lot is where is Trump a discontinuity with the Republican Party as one would have correctly understood it? And where is he an acceleration of a trend that was already there? You know, my background is policy reporting. So in the 2009, 10, 11, 12 era, I was covering the rise of the Tea Party and really the rise of deficit concern. Mm -hmm. Um, I was covering Paul Ryan's rise. And it's been really striking to me that after Ryan became speaker and, and Donald Trump became president, that not just did Republicans cut taxes without paying for at least part of that, but they also increased spending without paying for part of that. And having spent years covering in good faith the argument about deficits, not Mm -hmm. an argument I always agreed with, but an argument that I was willing to take seriously. The question that I'm left with was, was it always a farce? How does one explain away a party led by people who say debt was the biggest crisis coming this way, increasing the debt, again, not just on the tax side, but on the spending side? What I would say is um, that the... I think it was Jefferson said normal course of things was for government to gain ground and for liberty to yield. And so I would say that there is a certain inertia that goes with taking the easy route. And the easy route is yes and yes. Yes to less in the way of taxes. Yes to the way of more of spending. And so I'd say it is – it fits with the times that we live in, which is – Pollyanna, um, uh, easy, simplistic answers, um, and it's just going to be fine because it's just going to be fine. I would go back to, in fact, a Democrat. Uh, it was, I guess, uh, Erskine Bowles, who was former chief of staff to President Clinton, who ultimately, you know, headed up uh, or co-led the Bowles Simpson Commission. And his observation back then, about around 2010, was we're walking our way toward the most predictable financial crisis in the history of man. I still believe that. And so while, you know, Kevin McCarthy, others have become quite elastic in their belief system in the age of Trump, in part cowering to him and the force of his personality, I still think that math works. I still think that the long current of Republicans who've traditionally stood up against deficits is something that makes sense. And I think that right now is an anomaly that is going to, again, prove to be disastrous. So here's the criticism I get from the left on this stuff. They say, look, in the Bush era, Republicans didn't care about deficits. They cut taxes. They increased military spending. Then under Obama, they cared about it opportunistically. They, they used it as a weapon. Now we're back to Trump. And the, the reason I, I connect this to post-truth yeah. is that – You know, as a journalist, you're trying to give people a coherent view of the world, right? You're trying to trying to give them a way of understanding what's going on. And one way to do that is to take people's arguments as in good faith and and cover them seriously. And then you get into this problem of if people then don't align with what they say they believe, if their actions continuously diverge, then when you take it all in good faith, are you actually misinforming your audience? Again, that's I guess 
fits into the category of how many angels dance on the head of a pen. Uh, I don't know, and I'm not particularly focused on it. It's probably something you're more focused on as a journalist, in fairness. All I know is that we're living in a weird age and that all the, the things that have traditionally sold in a Republican Party, as I've been pro-Republican for 25 years now, aren't selling. And so I have every merit badge under the sun in terms of trying to walk the walk on saying deficits do matter and on trying to limit spending and taxes. And in this particular primary in June, those merit badges weren't selling. And there was one operative question that kept coming up, which is, are you for or against Trump? And I'd give this nuanced answer of, well, I'm neither for him nor against him. I'm for him on, on these policy elements. I'm against him on these particular elements. And that wasn't selling. That was not a selling message. And I think that's the larger takeaway for me, not necessarily consistent over the last 50 years in terms of the Republican Party, but how inconsistent this particular experience has been for me relative to my 25 years in the Republican Party. And that's why I do – I bring up this question of discontinuity, which is obviously the, the big question about it is not how it affects my, my work. Yeah. Um, but is – you know, you were saying that these are the things that have sold in the Republican Party for 25 years. And – there have certainly been important voices in the Republican Party, yours among them, who have sold these things. But there's also been this current in the party that gets into power and diverges. Not mm -hmm. not always in the way that Trump has, where he's got this personal erraticism sure. that makes it very, very present. But but again, you know, talking about say deficits in the Bush era. Mm -hmm. And I think it creates this question of has the Republican Party changed or has a mask come off? And that's the question I again, struggle with. What I, again, all I can give you is my mm -hmm. personal experience, and I would say it has changed. And I would say that I'm not alone in that perspective. Um, the number of people who come back to me at home and they say, uh, this wasn't a blowout election back in yeah. June. It was, you know, 3,000 votes one way or the other would have decided, and you got the president tweeting, and I mean, some unusual things, and a couple hundred votes to be in a runoff. And I've been in a couple of runoffs before, and I've won each of them. How many people voted in the primary total? Uh, about 50,000. And so people are, again, not, in other words, in, in, in a retail sense, on the stump, at least in South Carolina, talking about debt deficit government spending traditionally held an audience. And I'm just saying that audience has diminished, again, of late and in this election cycle in a way that I've never seen before. And so did you still end up about half the votes? Were people still care about that? Yeah. But there's a new flavor that's in town in a way that I've never seen it before. At least that's my personal experience. So when people came up to you on the campaign trail or at a town hall and they were upset at the way you were speaking about the president, I mean, how did they frame that anger? Right, because they probably wouldn't say that you know, I'm now part of a personality cult, and I want the I want the no. leader respected. How how do they understand their relationship with him versus their relationship at that point with you? It's a Faustian deal. I mean, I, I've argued with friends in the evangelical community that this is a Faustian deal. You cannot, as part of the faith community, say if I get a couple of good Supreme Courts, I don't care about any kind of personal action. Uh, or the way in which another human treats another human. That's just not consistent with the overall notion of faith. So what I'd say is people would come up and they say, look, he's the quarterback. you got to go with the quarterback. I said, well, that's not the system our founding fathers gave us. If they wanted that, they'd have done a king. They didn't. They wanted checks and balances. And, and so, for instance, on the issue of offshore drilling, which happened to be a big issue back home in South Carolina along the coast— I said, look, if every single municipality and hamlet has come out with a formal proclamation with their city council and with their mayor against what the president has proposed on offshore drilling, how do you want me to, quote, go with a quarterback? I mean, I, I thought I was supposed to represent this particular piece of geography in the United States of America, and it has some unique vantage points. I'm supposed to represent that viewpoint. But people are looking for an easy answer right now, and this is the scary part. And again, I'm not likening Trump to Hitler. I want to be clear on that. But I'm saying some we're planting seeds that could lead us to dangerous spots. Because if you read Hayek's book, The Road to Serfdom, what it talks about is how in open political systems over time, they become more and more dysfunctional to the point that the electorate gets frustrated. 
And then a strong man comes along and says, look, I'll take care of these problems for you. You got to give up a couple of freedoms, but I'll take care of these problems for you. And the deal is struck, and it's obviously the story of the rise of, of, of Hitler. We're playing with some of those same things because people, quote, just want to get something done. They want things better, and I get that. So I completely respect and understand the energy behind the Trump phenomenon. And and to your point, you saw it manifest itself earlier in the form of Tea Party. I mean, people have been frustrated and increasingly fr- frustrated for a while with the dysfunction of Washington and the way in which it's not working for themselves and those that they love. But what we have now is a newfound cult of personality that I think begins to take us in directions that I think in the long run could prove disastrous. Uh, it's something you, you were talking about there in terms of checks and balances. You know, when I think about the system and the geniuses inside it, the one thing that really seems to have changed in a way that I don't know that we know how to deal with it is that we were supposed to have these institutions competing with each other. You know, ambition checking ambition. Mm-hmm. And instead, you have two parties competing across institutions, across the Senate and the House and the White House and the Supreme Court. And that, you know, if one party, um, in this right now, the Republican Party, but it could happen with the Democratic Party, gets all of them, accountability flattens out. Mm-hmm. And it's why I was always interested in the op-ed you wrote demanding the, or asking for the tax returns because there's nothing particularly partisan about that. Why shouldn't Republicans want to know if there's something lurking in there that's problematic? And this seems to me to be a genuine weakness now of the system. Accountability is something that you can only count on in periods of divided government. Otherwise, the system does not have any kind of automatic accountability built into it because – the fundamental vision of it has been distorted by the rise of highly ideological, highly polarized parties. How do you fix that? that? Can you fix that? Uh, Well, yeah. Uh, Each of us as voters um, are part of fixing that. Um, I have become something of a fan of divided government given uh, my experiences with um, complete control, whether that's when I was governor of South Carolina. My big fights were with the Republicans, and they're well chronicled. Um, Again, you cannot go into our political system, particularly as a conservative, believing in Lord Acton's notion that power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely, without wanting a divide and a check on on power. Uh, So part of it is, as you point out, the way in which parties have now arranged themselves, Part of it's a breakdown of what voters are demanding of their legislators. I think the legislative body has become way too subservient to the executive branch, whether that's a Republican or a Democrat. Again, with the party in power. Right. You know what's not smart? Job sites that overwhelm you with a ton of the wrong resumes. But you know what is smart? ZipRecruiter.com. Unlike other job sites, ZipRecruiter, it doesn't wait for candidates to find you. ZipRecruiter finds them for you. Its powerful matching technology scans thousands of resumes, identifies people with the right skills, education, and experience for your job, and it actively invites them to apply. Because hiring is important. You want to be going out to find the people who are the best fit for your job, not just waiting for them to find you. The result is you get very qualified candidates very fast. There's no more sorting through gigantic mountains of wrong resumes. No more just waiting for the right candidates to stumble upon your ad. It's no wonder that ZipRecruiter is rated number one by employers in the U.S. And and this rating, it comes from hiring sites on Trustpilot with over a thousand reviews. So hire smart. Right now, listeners can try ZipRecruiter for free at this exclusive web address. It is ZipRecruiter.com slash EZRA. Again, that is ZipRecruiter.com slash EZRA. ZipRecruiter.com slash EZRA. ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. Looking for a way to make an impact in this November's election? Texting a reminder to someone you know makes them 10% more likely to vote. 10%. The Outvote app helps you find contacts that have missed a recent election or that live in critical swing districts that need help getting out the vote and makes it easy to help them get out the vote. This November, your connections, they can make a difference. Download the Outvote app and make an impact in just five minutes. One of the things that I've been thinking about while we've been talking is there's a line from a a political scientist named Julia Zari, and she says that the fundamental fact of politics now is that we have weak parties and strong partisanship. 
And one of the things that does is that if you win a primary, as Donald Trump did, the, the, the parties used to control primaries, right? You, Donald Trump couldn't have been the Republican nominee in 1950 right. because he right. can't win a convention. Right. But now he can because the, the primaries are much more small-D Democratic. Mm -hmm. But once you win that primary, the, the, the parties as coalitions of people are so far apart, so angry at each other that partisanship takes over and you do get these cults of personalities. It becomes impossible to imagine people abandoning their own side's person, no matter how different or how much violence they do to, to, to the traditional idea of what that party is. And I wonder a bit about that. You know, you, you talk a lot about the Founding Fathers' vision. Have we become um, too small d democratic? Have we lost too many of the checks that we're supposed to keep, give institutions and certain kinds of political elites a way to, to stop a train that was running off the tracks? Again, I, I, these are deep questions. I, I don't really know the answer to that. I just, again, know my personal experience, which is I've always been a fan of a weakened central authority as it relates to party. Uh, I never would have gotten elected to Congress the first time I ran if it had been decided by folks in a smoke-filled room. I was an outsider. I never would have gotten elected governor of South Carolina because I was the first governor in f more than 50 years who was not a product of the legislative body in South Carolina. So I've always been a fan of uh, small D rather than big D as it relates to, to party structure. But again, there's a breakdown in the system in what each one of us as voters are demanding of our leaders. It's a mark on society that the president can get away with as many distruths and half-truths as he does in a given day. You know, that, that, that's a societal question ultimately. It's, and I've come to feel strongly about it. it is I was doing an interview somewhere, and I said, I get the irony of me being, a, you know, somebody that's just really ramped up on the issue of truth, which I am, given my own personal experience, which is I lived a lie back in 2009. But here's why I've come to feel so strongly about this. A lie worked the way a lie is supposed to work, which is it was discovered. There were incredible ramifications for me personally, uh, uh, politically, socially, go down the list, maritally, go down the list. And, uh, and that's the way a lie is supposed to work. What we're institutionalizing now in our country is the acceptance of a lie on a regular basis from folks at the top. And if we continue down that road, again, it has real ramifications in an open political system. In 2009, when you when you were in that lie, why did you leave for six days? Well, I, I sort of have always understood the affair part of it, yeah. but the disappearing off the map, what was behind that? It's a longer personal story that I'm, you know, we'll come back to you on off air. But I'll just say uh, desperate people do desperate things. And I, there was a moment of desperation at that point in my life, um, period. Do you think that the... And, and, and I wasn't, you know, didn't disappear off the map. I was called and I came back home to my own self-inflicted guillotine. Do you think being in politics does good things to people's character? It simply uh, reveals character. But it can have a corrosive effect if one plays to the cameras, listens to the crowd. Uh, I, I, I think that um, either one's faith or a core group of friends... Um, a governing philosophy. There got to be some anchors, and if there aren't, then the ego grows, and problems of the ego grow with it. I want to go back to what you're saying about being fired up about truth. Is Fox News and the conservative media ecosystem part of the permission structure that has allowed the Republican Party and Donald Trump to sort of lead it in this more almost postmodern direction? I think that all the networks are part of the problem. I mean, they've simply become cheerleaders for the respective sides. So if you want to get the left flavor, go to MSNBC. If you want to get the right flavor, go to Fox. So as a consequence, people pick their version of the story, and we see that much more in the way of polarization. And this is, to a degree, the demon that either Trump has unleashed or exposed which is I've done town hall meetings for 25 years of my life. I've been engaged with the public for 25 years of my life. But what I saw here over the last couple of years since Trump came into office 
was a degree of polarization and friction and animosity that I'd never seen before. And I remember going up to one person, it was a crowd of like a thousand, which is a big crowd to just randomly show up for a town hall meeting. And this guy was just chewing my head off. And uh, and I, I go up to him, I said, look, you know, I, I get it, we can feel strongly about things, but, you know, I'm from South Carolina, I know you are too. I mean, your vocabulary just doesn't fit uh, with who I know you to be by reputation. And he says, well, here's the deal. If the president of the United States can say anything to anybody at any time on any subject, why can't I? And that's the danger. He's given people license to express themselves in ways that I've never seen before in politics. And those are demons that will come back to roost. That's an amazing story. I want to push you a little bit here on the media question. I fully grant that there's plenty of bad left-wing media out there. But but one thing that is different— I didn't um, say bad. I said bad. Yeah. yeah. Just to be <laughs> I think there is right, bad left-wing right, media right, out there. Right. Um, I'll say that very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, but there's this Pew uh, poll during the election that I thought is really interesting. And what it basically showed is that voters on the left, they consume a lot of liberal media, but they consume a pretty wide variety of media. They, you know, they like— um, MSNBC, but they like the New York Times. They actually read the Wall Street Journal in pretty big numbers. You know, they, they're kind of all over the map. They NBC. It's a lot of stuff that sees itself as down the line and then stuff that also sees itself on the left. And on the right, you had this very, very distinct clustering around Fox News. It was, you know, a couple media outlets and they were all really right of center. And so – you know, I think that there's a, certainly a place for opinionated media. I mean, my, my organization, I'm opinionated and as a journalist. I, I try to be very rigorous about it, but certainly, you know, I have views. What worries me on the right is that it's a much more narrow form of media consumption. And so without the um, gatekeepers and institutions that have different incentives, you can get into, you know, very radical ecosystems. And that seems to me, because of the, the consumption pattern, to be more of a threat on the right right now than on the left. I think that's a function of power, though. I mean, I think that's a function of Republicans holding the, the House, Senate, uh, the preponderance of governorships and the legislative bodies across the, the, the country, as well as the White House. And I think you'd see that same ecosystem grow if the roles were reversed in terms of the power structure. Hmm. So if Democrats held more power, they would sort of go to more aligned media? Well, I, I, again, I, I don't know who is drinking, you know, Bernie Sanders Kool-Aid. Uh, it, it's not a media source that I pull from. But, you know— there's a group called Indivisible back home, and they would turn out massive groups via social media at town hall meetings. It, when I talked to them, uh, they sure weren't listening to Fox News. I mean, it was a, a narrow band on their side of the equation. Again, and I don't begrudge them. It's difference of opinion that makes the world go round. But I would just say that I, I would bet that, that that system that you're talking about would duplicate itself on the left if the left held the preponderance of power mm -hmm. In our political system, you, you strike me. As so a guy. I think it, it's it's dangerous either way, and that's how I've always tried to shoot it down the middle. But again, there is no room for the middle right now in the world of politics. I was always strident uh, on on spending and debt deficit, government spending issues. But you know, Sierra Club endorsed me on my second uh, nomination for the governorship of South Carolina, which I mean, I think I was the only Republican uh, governor that had been endorsed by I don't know uh, in how many years. And so I've I've always voted, I think, my district or my state on other issues that weren't tied to that core governing philosophy with regard to spending. Do you think uh, what you're saying about the middle and just actually what we've been talking about yeah. in general, is fundraising and the role of money in politics part of the problem? I mean, I, I, I guess it always will be. Um, but, you know, the counterpoint to that would be, well, Wait a minute. Uh, if you don't allow folks to fundraise, I, I believe in transparency in the process. Everybody ought to – I mean, in, in fact, we instituted when I was in South Carolina so that one could go online to see who got money from where you know, on a real-time basis. Uh, so I think transparency is key. I think it's very difficult to limit it. Um, that's been my observation, having been around the process for a while. I was originally an author to McCain-Feingold way back when because I saw the corrupting influence. But as I've been in it longer, you're like, well, wait a minute. It, it's, you know, if you push on here, then it comes up over here. And the Supreme Court has said what it said with regard to the speech issue. 
I think that if you try and move to a British system and just say, okay, it's really finite both in terms of, of money and duration of campaign, you give that much more advantage to the Donald Trumps of the world because whether it's Jesse Ventura or whether it's Donald Trump, people with celebrity in essence have money in the bank based on name ID. And you can't buy a product if you don't know the product. It's sort of the first rung on the ladder. And it's oftentimes as far as many people get. You look at those city council folks on your ballot, most folks will go, I have no idea who these people are. And they'll say, I think I've heard of that one. I think I'll vote for that one. And that's about the degree of deliberation. Obviously, you go up the the pecking order and there's more awareness. But I I think you'd want to be very watchful of any system that didn't allow for some degree of regular person having some chance at parity toward the celebrity candidate that increasingly you see out there. I think that makes sense. The thing that I, among the things I worry about in the space, is actually just the time. When I talk to members of Congress, the amount of time they spend fundraising, particularly if they're in a competitive race, you know, this is a hard job. Mm -hmm. There's a lot to learn. Mm -hmm. I mean, the things we're asking you all to vote on are vast. Mm -hmm. And just the amount of time that goes into fundraising, and then that means the amount of time they spend talking to a certain class of people, the people with money to, to give, it both seems like it lowers the quality of our representation and seems distorting of, you know, people's understanding of, you know, what are the opinions that need to be taken seriously and heard. Yeah, but but again, competing interests and perspectives out there. I know that obviously after 2009, I thought politics was ever, forever over for me. And then, you know, something happened that never happens in South Carolina, which is a senator, U.S. senator, retired. We carry ours out in body bags. I mean, they just don't retire in South Carolina. Somebody did, and that set in motion um, a seat coming open, and I was had gone back to real estate, which is what I used to do for a living. And these guys walk in the office uh, who I was officing with, and they say, well, you got to do this. I'm like, no way. Been through the fire. The scabs are finally healing. Not a chance. Anyway, one thing leads to another. And end up getting in the race. And we were outspent um, like five and six to one. I remember looking at Act Blue, uh, which I'd never heard of, but, you know, they amalgamate funds on the Democratic side. And you'd look at these sheets and it was 2,700, 2,700, 2,700, 2,700 from just like one zip code out in L.A. And I'm like, these people don't even know me to hate me. I mean, well, where, where is this coming? And so... You know, I, I would say, uh, yep, do people spend too much time on it? Yes. Um, are there certain districts where it's it's all-encompassing? Yes. But I would say if one has enough to get a message out, you can be heavily outspent and still make it. So, again, it, it's a problem. It's not our greatest threat these days. I think that the lack of faith in institutions that have served us awfully well for a long time is a bigger problem. Our ramp up on spending from a Republican side, abandonment of certain ideals on that front is a bigger problem. I think our uh, disengagement from trade and, and the engagement that it brings with the rest of the world is a big, I think, just think there are a lot of bigger problems out there in the world right now. On the lack of institutional faith, Obviously, the decline in faith in institutions goes way back before Trump, way back before, you know, this immediate political era. What is the story you tell of that? Why why do you think people have lost faith in in institutions that, you know, powered quite a bit of American prosperity? Well, I don't know if you saw Ken Burns' special on Vietnam. It's a spectacular series. Fairly big investment of time to go through all all of uh, his clips, but but. You know, you look at something like Vietnam where basically people were lying about what was happening. And then you look at other wars and conflicts since where people, uh, if they weren't lying, they're doing the first cousin to it. And people say, these people don't know what they're talking about. I mean, it's part of what makes me a conservative. I, like, I don't want to give more power and authority to these folks. Uh, they'll misuse it uh, or they'll abuse it. And so that's part of it. I, I think that it was easy to trust institutions in the 1950s, let's say, because our larger environment was fairly benign. I think people are freaking out about globalization and their place in the world and whether or not they're going to have a job or whether or not the kids are going to have a job. Same with, uh, you know, automation and, and the technology boom. And so I just think that people are at a much more fragile spot personally. 
And as a consequence, it causes them to look around them uh, in ways that maybe they haven't in the past as to what's working and not working for them and those that they love. How about one of the things that was powerful in Donald Trump's rise was that in a Republican Party that was beginning to try to moderate itself, particularly on immigration after 2012, he came out and said, no, 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 we're not going to do that. We're going to build a wall. We're going to keep America the way it is. That seems like it's become a very power, maybe always has been, but has, is currently a very powerful force in the Republican Party. How much is fear of a changing America driving what's going on on the right? Big time. I mean, people, as I said, you go to those uh, more rural districts in Ohio and you had, you know, the heartland of America in terms of manufacturing and a lot of those jobs have gotten hollowed out. Um, we went through that in South Carolina back when I was governor. You know, textiles used to be king. And uh, the upstate of South Carolina was decimated with the textile move to, you know, the Far East and to a lesser extent to Mexico. And uh, our point was, no, the nature of creative destruction is that things change. We don't want to be making buggy whips anymore. Let's go after high-tech manufacturing. And so we have BMW and we have Volvo and we have Boeing and a lot of other high-tech manufacturing jobs that have replaced those other jobs. But that process of transition is painful for people. There were small towns and hamlets in the upstate of South Carolina that uh, in the long run, they're getting to the point of prosperity. But in the short run, people eat and they need a house and they need to take care of all the basics of life. And there were really tough transitions for folks. And that, that environment of fear is what I think at times Trump has played to. You know, they, they say in the stock market, it's a bull or a bear, it's, it's fear or it's hope. What we don't want to do is have our political construct based on fear. It tends to bring out some, again, cross currents that are a long way from the cross currents that the founding fathers believed in, which was that we were to be that bright, shining city on the hill and institutions that brought hope and played to the, quote, the American dream. Those aren't bearish sentiments. Those are bullish sentiments. And I think a lot of what's at play right now and a lot of what Trump has tapped into have been the sentiments of fear, which is not historically what we've been about as a country. Every week, I interview an array of fascinating people across industries on The Ezra Klein Show. Coming up, hear an advertiser segment from our sponsor, Betterment, about life-changing financial advice. Do you know the emotion most often associated with money? Anxiety. <laughs> Anxiety, right? We've all felt that. But where does it come from? There's kind of a couple of different components to it. Some of them are really practical and they're valid, right? Like money is the ability to buy things that you need. We have other components of anxiety about money, which are more about just the social and psychological components of it. You can see other people spending money, but not other people saving money. That's Dan Egan. He's the Director of Behavioral Finance and Investing with Betterment, an online financial advisor that reduces investment anxieties by helping clients set and meet goals. When you sign up to Betterment, we're going to ask you a lot of questions that are just practically useful. You know, like, are you married? Where do you live? How much money do you make? Because that influences what are the best account types to use? What kind of tax breaks can you use? How much do you need to be saving and over what period of time? According to Egan, the result of this can be summed up in one word. Uh, elation. When you have that sense of accomplishment of having hiked up a very large mountain and gotten to the top and you can see for miles, it really pays off a lot more than you expect and those kind of memories stick with you for longer. Betterment. Outsmart average. Please remember, investing involves risk. This has been advertiser content from Betterment. Thanks for that note from our sponsor, Betterment. To learn more about the tools, visit betterment.com slash easy R-A. We've been talking a lot about uh, your perspective on how the Republican Party has changed. What do you think of the Democratic Party? How is that different than when you came into politics? The political environment is as polarized as I have ever seen it, period. I saw that in town hall meetings, wherein if you said one thing that was viewed to be slightly pro-Trump, you'd have a thousand people booing at you and making noise. If you said one thing that was slightly anti-Trump, to a, a different audience, you'd have a bunch of people screaming at you and fussing at you, and ultimately an electoral consequence, the likes of which I saw. 
And I tried to, to do both. I tried to engage with both sides. While a lot of my peers were not having town hall meetings, I was having town hall meetings with a thousand plus folks. I've never backed away from debate and engagement of the war of ideas. But that's not where we are right now. So I think that both camps, Republican and Democrat, right and left right now, have pulled into their respective foxholes and people aren't talking to each other. And you have a media that plays to either audience. Uh, and so uh, people sort of filter their news. You have social media that plays to either audience. And, you know, the idea of e pluribus unum from the many one, which was the construct of the founding fathers, is not what's playing out in the political landscape these days. So I couldn't give you detail as to perspectives from the left because that's not my perspective. But what I would say, at least in observation, is the same phenomenon that you described on the right, I've seen on the left in the town hall meetings and the discussions that I've had in the wake of those town hall meetings with friends on the left. So I've been, you've brought up the Founding Fathers and their sort of more unified vision a couple of times. I've been on a big Founding Fathers biographies kick for the last year or so. Uh, it's nice to not spend all of my time in this particular political era sure, right now. Sure, sure. And I guess from a place of a little bit of optimism, they were pretty divisive. I mean, the presses that they were relying on and funding in many cases were much more slanderous and much more polarized and much more, I don't know if you want to call it post-truth. It might have been in some cases pre-truth uh, than, than the ones we're dealing with. There was much less of a kind of stable informational commons that people are working off of. And for all that, uh, for all there's a lot of disagreement between politicians – yeah, nobody's dueling. <laughs> so I, I wonder. I wonder how new some of this is, right? We the 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 republic has survived periods of very sharp enmity before. Uh, yeah, I hear you. But for all the back and forth and pettiness and other that went on at that time, it was not the language of Thomas Jefferson. I mean, I went to UVA for grad school, and I guess we all idolized Thomas Jefferson, but uh, or at least those of us who went to UVA, um, but. His prose was at least beautiful. Oh yeah, and, and, his and, prose and, and, was beautiful. And, and, but he funded very aggressive papers. Okay, but but again, the prose was at least tied to the larger construct of how do we move this ball forward together as Americans. And George Washington certainly set that example. And you can come through with a lot of presidents, Republican or Democrat, where at least they were pointing to true North and using positive. Prose. What I've never heard before is a presidential candidate, as was the case with Trump, saying to somebody in the audience, hey, uh, you know, I, I, I would hit you if I could, but uh, I tell you what, uh, somebody else ought to do it and I'll pay their legal fees. Mm -hmm. I've never heard that kind of thing before. To me, that's crazy world. And so would people have differences with one another? Yes. But were those differences refined one to the other and maybe they'd go out and duel, which fortunately it doesn't exist. I mean, there are a lot of crazy things that have happened. But we, what you have now is a media that amplifies this stuff and a platform for the way in which messages can move that with all due respect to the pamphlets of the time back in the 1700s just didn't move people's opinions quite as quickly because they couldn't. Uh, they just, you know, I, I think the danger of mass media in the forms that we have it now is that people's opinions can move that much faster than they did in the 1700s. I mean, at the, yeah, at the end of the day, yeah, you could you could send pamphlets, but you still had to get on a, st a carriage uh, to go from South Carolina up to Washington, D.C., and it would still take you, you know, a couple of weeks to get there. I mean, things just didn't move as fast. One of the things that, to, to your point about uh, rhetoric, one of the things that, I've been thinking a lot about is that I've been going back and reading some Obama speeches for something else I'm doing. And uh, for all the talk now about how politicians need to rediscover how to talk about a national identity, he was very good at talking about a national identity. Mm -hmm. And if you look at his rhetoric, it's, it's quite beautifully done. And his presidency gave way to Donald Trump's presidency. And I'm curious why you think that is, why you think that it was – Obama that led the Republican Party to Trump. Because, you know, there's a lot about Obama and I get how you disagree with him. And, you know, it's, I mean, he was a liberal president. Mm -hmm. But I think it is reasonable to say that he did not try to be intensely provocative. I would agree with that. Um, 
I wrote an op-ed in state paper back home saying, talking about breaking glass ceilings, we all ought to celebrate them. And, you know, I live in a state where there were slaves and a lot of atrocities that went with slavery, but we have a, 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 a black nominee for president. I mean, I, a mm-hmm. Republican governor writing that op-ed is not exactly, you know, conventional. Um, so I think that his rhetoric was strong, but a lot of his policies were inflammatory to folks on the right. And whether that's with Dad Frank or whether it is with uh, the Affordable Care Act, those policies were, you know, inflammatory. And, and so people reacted to that. But I think more to the point, you know, his red line in Syria was, you know, an erased line. And you could look at other things like that where they felt like there wasn't resolve. And you do have, you know, folks that were crossing up. I think it was Honduras, Ecuador, and El Salvador saw particular surges Mm -hmm. during his presidency in terms of immigration, particularly with young folks. And uh, and so people say enough is enough. I want somebody who's strong, it goes right back again to Hayek, who will fix this stuff for me. And so I think he did uh, pave the way for the president. But again, part of what's going on are these bigger pressures that people are feeling as as small towns in Ohio have been hollowed out with globalization. I mean, you brought up his his race at the beginning there. I take the point about his policies, right? I completely understand how conservative would would vote against um, Barack Obama. But it does seem to me that one of the things that happened was that Obama represented a kind of change in the country. And like just physically who he was, seeing him on TV every day. Uh, and, you know, and, and there were other things going on sure. around him, right, that it made his presidency possible. I always think about Obama in 2012 when a smaller proportion of the white vote than Michael Dukakis in 1988, but he was still able to win the election. I mean, things were changing. Things are changing. And that that in terms of what people want fixed, in terms of why they're turned into a strong man, it's – it's a more profound sense that a country, you know, is, is really becoming something different. During Obama's presidency, it was the first time that um, a majority of infants in the country were non-white. And that feels to me like one of the big f- tensions in the society right now, one that we don't always know how to talk about, but that is driving a lot of our politics. Could well be. I come from South Carolina, and we don't have as many of those pressures as many other states. So, I don't know it as well as, as, as you might with a national perspective on that. Mm-hmm. Who in the Republican Party is – when you look at like it as having a next generation, do you think the next generation looks like Donald Trump or do you think the next generation looks like what preceded Trump? Or is there some kind of – are there politicians who are some kind of synthesis who you see as being the future? I don't know the answer to that question. Um, Again, what I do know is personal experience. In my primary, uh, my opponent took latitude with the truth in a way that I've never before seen. And it goes back to the question that the person in the town hall raised of, wait a minute, if the president can do it, why can't I? We'd have a debate and something would come up and i say, well, you know, you whatever. And they said, no, I didn't. And you'd go back to your folks that night and you go, well, did you guys give me bad information? What's the story here? No, she's just making it up. And, uh, and, and so what I hope is temporary and what I hope to be an anomaly is the way in which there's latitude with the truth that's accepted in ways that I've never before seen it in my 25 years in politics as to who comes along that manifest either reaction to or embrace of the Trump phenomenon? I don't know, but we'll see. Do you think that, I don't want to say protection of the truth, do you think the latitude around the truth that you're talking about, to the degree that politicians felt a little more tied to it, say, 20 years ago, was that because of them? Um, Was it because of the politicians, you know, they had a little bit more of shame or a different sense of the public? Or is it because of external forces, gatekeepers, and media? Like, is it a guardrail issue or is it a leadership issue? I think it's a bit of both. Um, But it's probably more guardrail than leadership. We had, again, institutions, which is part of it would be church and faith. And the church has been amazingly silent on on the Trump phenomenon and some of of what is now accepted and sort of look the other way. I mean, when I, you know, I had an affair and um, 
again, I will make no excuses for that. My marriage dissolved. Um, I won't go into the whys and the whats, but it, it was a bad chapter of life in every sense of the word. And I didn't handle the dissolution of mar- my marriage the right way, period. Not that there is a right way to handle it, but it was messy. But, I mean, I was just crushed, rightfully so, for how I handled that chapter of life. Some of those same people that were so strong in their judgment on how I handled that give Trump a complete pass on his personal actions. And so something's changing out there in the political marketplace, and that's relatively quick. So part of it's a guardrail phenomenon. It's a bigger indictment on society as to to the way in which we'll just say, rather than condemning me, as was appropriately the case then, we just say, well, it doesn't matter if I get good Supreme Court justices, I, I don't really care. Well, you ought to care. I mean, McCain wrote a book years ago, Character is Destiny, and I think that there's some truth to that. Uh, it doesn't mean that we're all of sterling character. It doesn't mean any of us are perfect. It doesn't mean we none of us have events in our lives that we don't regret and we wish we had handled differently, but it means that there ought to be at least a a quest or a push in that direction. And what I've seen absent in the political environment these days is judgment or, or a push for uh, corrective action on that front. It's just like there's a new lie and a new lie and a new lie and a new lie, and it's all okay. Uh, but I think it'll prove to be anything but. I've seen a lot of surprising polls the last couple of years, but the one that I've not been able to get out of my head is, and I, I may get the numbers wrong from memory, but but they're approximately right, that in 2015, um, evangelicals were asked, you know, can you separate a person's character from their political uh, life, mm-hmm. right? Can, can public life and private life in, in terms of morality be severed? And 80 uh, some percent said no. And two years later, Donald Trump is president, or maybe it was just one year later, and a majority said yes. And, and I've experienced that. Yeah. I mean, direct and personal. Uh, and I'm seeing, you know, I don't know the polls. I don't know the numbers that you know. But I have seen it in my own life based on the rightful judgment that I got in the wake of 2009 versus what I'm seeing endorsed and okayed right now. Do you think it's because you apologized and Donald Trump didn't? Something he seems to me to have figured out is that the press and the public, if the press says you did something wrong and you say you did something wrong, well, then we can all agree you did something wrong. If the press says you did something wrong and you say, no, the press is fake news and they're against you, well, then it's a fight. Mm -hmm. Is the lesson never apologize? This is where you really struggle with it as a dad because that's contrary to every single lesson I've ever tried to teach our four sons, that you are going to make mistakes in life. It's part of our shared humanity. We all have feet of clay. And you got to remember this notion of, but by the grace of God, go I. And, and as you think about judgment or others, or you think about the consequences of your own failures. Part of our shared humanity has to be uh, this notion of apology, sorrow, regret, and shame for the things that you get wrong. Because if not, again, there ain't no connect between us as human beings. If you can just do your thing without any uh, care or concern to the degree to which it may have shattered my world or vice versa, we're living in a very strange world. It's beyond Ayn Rand at that point. Um, And again, our entire political system breaks down if that's the mentality. Part of a democracy is not only truth, but some degree of shared faith in your fellow man Because if not, there's no way that the system works together. You have to have a degree of faith. It can't be uh, everybody out for themselves and zero sum. There has to be some degree of collective benefit that comes by working together as a society. Now, as somebody who, you know, as a politician, I'm sure worked with the faith community for a long time, how do you explain what happened? I mean, we've talked about that it happened, but I, I would have never predicted that. Were people always wrong about what the bottom lines of that world were, or did something occur? Was there some reason that in 2015, 2016, that became possible? I don't. I, I don't know. I just. I've just known the degree to which it's changed 
based on my own personal experiences and what I've observed. What would be your advice for someone young who's listening to this, who wants to go into politics, who sees it as a broken place and wants to come in and fix it, but, you know, looks around and says, um, you know, is there space in it for normal human beings? I hope so. I, again, my niche has never been particularly shrill on, on the partisan side. I've tried, you know, the, the people that will go to a precinct meeting are very different than the people you see at, at your supper club or in, in your rotary club. Uh, and I've always tried to play to that particular audience because, you know, most people don't think in Republican or Democratic terms. They think of, you know, again, my alignment with others of faith or my community or my uh, you fill in the blanks. Um and and that's where historically most folks have been, and that's historically what's driven our political system has been the center. But that's not what's driving it right now. You've got either extreme. And I had a friend come to me the other day. He says, I don't know where to go. I don't want to give everything away and pretend that numbers don't matter and sign up for the Bernie Sanders routine, but nor do I want to be condescending, mean, and rude to my fellow man. Uh, in more the Trump model. I, I don't know where to go. And so what I'd say is we absolutely need more people who will take into account both viewpoints, process them as best they can based on their political philosophy, and call it like they see it and let the chips fall where they may. Um, I would beg of more, quote, regular people to be involved in the political process. You had a line in another interview where you said that democracy is hard and it's painful and it's cumbersome, but but it's the best we have. We talk a lot about what is needed of our leaders. We don't talk a lot about what is needed of citizens. When you said that, when you said democracy is a difficult thing to do, what what, what is it? What What is the job of the citizen in a democracy? It's in having the courage to advance the ideas that you believe in, the humility to accept uh, other points of view, the wisdom to incorporate the two. And that's, again, not what we have right now. People aren't listening to each other. Our system doesn't work without humility uh, in saying, I know I believe this, and I believe it strongly, but help me to become more educated on your viewpoint because I don't have a lock on wisdom and truth. Too many of the political actors are right now pretending that they have a lock on truth and virtue, which no one does. And they're not listening to the other side. And and that's true in the local community uh, with a neighbor versus a neighbor. I mean, I think it's telling that some guy's assaulting Rand Paul as he's cutting grass. I mean, that's just a weird world that we're living in. Uh, or, you know, you go to some of the president's uh, more dramatic statements that I think are, you know, uh, horribly consequential over the long run. Um, and so I would just say it's hard work because it requires work. It requires people uh, doing homework and not accepting the easy answer. And it requires leadership from folks in the body politic, which we're not seeing. You contrast sort of the pastry chef approach we have these days, which is if you don't like this dessert, well, then how about this one, this one, or this one, versus the the, the approach of of more the country doctor, which was maybe the approach of somebody like Abraham Lincoln. This is going to really hurt. It's going to be painful. But ultimately, as a patient, you'll be much better uh, for it. That process of trying to sell a tough message is something that's lacking in politics today. It is pure pandering that you see with the Trump effect. I mean, it's telling that as a Republican, he said, well, we're not going to touch Medicare. We're not going to touch Social Security, but we got to do something about spending, uh, recognizing the fact that the bulk of all spending at the federal level is on the entitlement side. So, well, it's increased spending. Right, even, right. Even right. beyond that. Yeah, yeah. So I would say it's hard work because it requires work from everyone and everyone to be a participant in the process. Let me ask you the question we always used to end the podcast, which is what are three books you've read over the years that have influenced you, that matter to you, that you would recommend to the audience? Um, you know, I think Graham Allison's newest book on a possible conflict with China, I think, is one that uh, I'm in the process of starting. I just read uh, Fascism by uh, Madeleine Albright, which I thought to be interesting. I loved uh, Neil Ferguson's book, The Tower and the Square, or The Square and the Tower. I can't remember which it was. But just talking about the way in which 
the construct for the way in which we communicate has changed. I think that it was a pretty interesting book. Those would be the three most recent books that uh, I'm sort of working my way through or have just read. Congressman Mark Sanford, thank you very much. Pleasure. Thank you to Congressman Sanford for being here. I hope you all enjoyed that as much as I did. Thank you, of course, to my producer, Jillian Weinberger, my engineer, Griffin Tanner. If you've got a moment, go to Apple Podcasts and give us a review, give us a rating. It really helps in the way their algorithm is built for other people to find the show. And it's a great way, if you're enjoying it, giving me a hand and making sure others can enjoy it too. All that said, thank you for being here. And we'll be back in a couple of days. 